the 10th episode of Funding Stories. And I'm happy to have Jason here. He's co-founder of Zephyr Computing. And what we try to do at Funding Stories is we try to bring awesome companies and describe their story, what they did with US federal agencies and not the Luda funding, talk a little bit about what we did together and kind of give an interesting highlight on the company itself. So here, I'm excited to bring in Jason. Jason, thanks for joining. Yeah, happy to be here. So I, I hope the board in the background doesn't have like any proprietary stuff where like all the IP is now being recorded or stuff like that. Uh, no, this is actually just uh, notes on our marketing strategy actually, but um, this is kind of a more interesting background than uh, just a plain white wall. The, the San Francisco bridge as a fake uh, as a fake background. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so let's kind of start with you with a little bit. What's kind of like the best thing you think you did? What's kind of the worst? If you can talk about it, just give us a little bit of a background and kind of who you are. Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career is actually uh, from my time at Capella Space. Um, that's where I actually met and worked with all of the uh, founders of Zephyr Computing. Uh, and one of the major tasks that we worked on there was building the software-defined radio that Capella uses to this day for synthetic aperture radar, high data rate communications, as well as onboard data processing. Um, it was a kind of a hectic start there. Um, within a couple of weeks of joining, uh, the deal fell through with the vendor who was supposed to be providing the, the radio. Uh, and uh, we didn't really have a backup plan at the time. So everybody kind of looked at me and said, hey, you're the second electrical engineer. Uh, do you think you can build it from scratch? And uh, <laughs> kind of looked around and was like, well, you know, let's try it. And um, yeah, six months later, we had hardware on the bench uh, getting ready for testing. And uh, that's the design that's still flying to this day. Uh, there's been some changes, uh, minor changes since I left, but the, the core design uh, proved to be uh, very reliable for them. So uh, yeah, that's probably one of the highlights of my career, especially in, in the space industry. Wow. What, what, what's something uh, that you got some scar tissue on or something that you learned from like a disincentive? Uh, yeah, well, um, I before Capella, uh, the reason that I was looking for a new job was uh, I was at a startup that unfortunately uh, didn't quite make it to a, a Series B. So uh, uh, I joined as uh, basically employee number eight there. Um, again, like the second electrical engineer, uh, learned a lot about how uh, small businesses and startups work and uh, got a lot of valuable experience, but uh, unfortunately, towards the end there, um, the, the burn rate was too high and the next round of funding didn't come through and uh, got invited to uh, an all hands later that day. And um, that was about it. So uh, pretty quick ending, uh, kind of all knew it was happening at some point, but, uh, you know, didn't know the exact timing. So, yeah, I'd say that maybe a, a, a low light of uh, my career. So it sounds rough. So, so you, you moved from like a big company to starting your own business. Mm -hmm. What's what's like the biggest lesson from that delta? Uh, the well, the biggest lesson uh, for being the the CEO of a small business is uh, just uh, never underestimate uh, how much other stuff there is to do. So you might be <laughs> very excited about the the product. Um, but there's so much more to running a business than just the technical aspects of you know, designing circuit boards and testing hardware. Um, that's been one of the biggest uh, growth areas in, in the last couple of years here for me is just learning all of the, the non-technical stuff of running a business. And when you're the CEO, that could be anything from uh, raising money, writing proposals, um, pitching and selling. Uh, but it might also be, you know, washing the dishes in the, in the sink and, um, you know, sweeping the floors or, you know, whatever else needs to be done. And uh, yeah, my, I guess my number one advice would be like, don't, don't underestimate all that other stuff that you need to do to make a successful business. Wow. So, so walk us through, let's talk a little bit about kind of Zephyr computing, like what do you actually do and outside sweeping floors like what's the like what's the value that you like provide 
Yeah, so the the origin story here uh, goes back to my the previous job that I had before uh, starting Zephyr, and that was uh, the principal electrical engineer at Loft Orbital. And uh, my role there was managing all things electrical. Uh, now, Loft Orbital is a, a hosted payload provider or space infrastructure provider. So they uh, will build satellites to order. They also build uh, shared uh, satellites where there's multiple payloads on one bus. And uh, one of the uh, new features that Loft was interested in adding at the time was uh, edge computing. And uh, the, the idea there was they would uh, bring that in as part of their standard platform and then offer that as a value add service to uh, their customers. So if somebody else had a payload that needed some edge computing resources, they'd be able to provide that um, as well as uh, provide opportunities for uh, what we call massless payloads. Uh, so these are really software packages that could be uploaded and tested in space. So uh, part of my job there was to survey the market and look for an edge computing solution that could be easily integrated into the Loft platform. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I was very frustrated with the, the lack of options that were out there on the market. Uh, I knew it was possible because we had built it at Capella, uh, but you know, it's an internal tool for them. So um, after I moved on from Loft and started Zephyr, that's uh, what we wanted to focus on was building these sorts of edge computing solutions for the wider satellite market. Okay. So, so compared to where you are at the market or compared to when you started, it sounds like that was the edge. Um, so when it, yeah, when I say uh, edge computing, it really refers to um, moving the computation to the sensor platform. So uh, in this case, uh, with a satellite, it might have an imager that's collecting uh, optical imaging data. Uh, and with our edge computing solution, uh, you can process that data onboard the satellite and reduce mm -hmm. gigabytes of data down to you know, kilobytes of data products. Um, and then that's something you can send through satellite to satellite communications and um, get results down to the ground in a couple of minutes instead of waiting a few hours for a ground station pass. Um, and then for uh, beyond Earth orbit, you know, looking at landing on the moon or Mars, um, the sort of edge computing technology is going to be critical to enabling those science missions. So it's a really key technology for the, the space sector. Okay. And, and where Zephyr is at today? How do you see the market? Where are you trying to go? Um, like, what is the edge that you're trying to bring with Zephyr forward? Mm. Yeah, so- uh, like The edge in the market, not edge competing for, for just yeah, yeah. Ones, but- Okay, uh, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, the, the, in terms of the, how we think about the market, um, we're kind of looking at it in terms of uh, established industries that are ready to go and ready to purchase uh, our products. And then there's kind of the next generation of technologies that are coming out. So in that first category uh, of established businesses, that's things like earth observation, uh, big companies like Planet and Maxar are already taking uh, loads of pictures every day. Uh, Capella Space would be in that category. Uh, so they're, they're pretty well established. Uh, same with uh, space infrastructure. So these are uh, hosted payload platforms, that sort of thing, are, are flying pretty regularly now. Um, the, the next uh, iteration is going to be more focused on satellite to satellite communications, as well as satellite inspection and servicing. Uh, and that's where things really get interesting. So with the, the current market, we can enhance uh, the state of the art, but things like satellite servicing uh, absolutely require the sort of computers that we have to process the data on the edge in real time and um, respond to stuff uh, when you don't have uh, standard or uh, reliable communications back to earth. So this would be um, uh, rendezvous uh, and proximity operations as well as docking. Um, kind of the, the way that I explain it is that uh, historically in the space industry, the, um, we, we have had edge computers, but they've been called astronauts and they've been looking at the window and flying the, the ship. But if we want to do that in an automated fashion, uh, we need uh, computers to basically replace that functionality. Wow. So, so what's the initial response when people hear um, what you're bringing? Is, 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 there, is there a lot of objection or, or how well is, is kind of your pitch or your value proposition received? Yeah, so um, 
we kind of look at it in uh, two different ways. So with our um, next product that coming up is uh, Pelican. That's our rad tolerant SSD. Uh, it's kind of more of a, an evolution. Uh, it's basically a high reliability, high capacity uh, data storage solution. Uh, so satellites today already use a data storage and regular operation. And so it's pretty easy for our customers to see how our product fits into that paradigm. But to, uh, to really take advantage of edge computing uh, requires a paradigm shift in mission planning. And so what we're finding is for those customers that are focused on the co uh, compute side of things, we um, really need to talk to them pretty early on in their uh, mission planning before they've even really uh, built hardware, uh, just because the capabilities that the high, high performance edge computing provides are um, very uh, unique and uh, to really take full advantage of them, uh, you need to completely rethink how you're running your whole mission. Uh, it sounds like you have to catch the, the clients or the people using your, your your hardware really, really soon, like at the at the design stage. Uh, ideally, yes, because um, you know, for example, if you need to uh, size how much uh, data storage you need on board, uh, that's going to depend on what you want to do with it. So, um, you know, if you're just storing between capture and downlink, that's a different scenario than uh, keeping a whole database or maybe an AI model uh, loaded on board. Uh, so, so yeah, very different use case, and it can really uh, resize everything. You know, m modern uh, or uh, kind of the state of the art right now in, in mission planning, especially uh, from the NASA side of things, is they'll decide on the mission objectives and then size everything based on that. So if you're sizing an imager, uh, but you only have so much bandwidth to get data back to the ground, it doesn't really uh, matter if that imager's uh, four times as better, eight times as better, because you can't do anything with the data anyway. But mm -hmm. with edge computing, you'd be able to take advantage of that. And so that might change how big of a camera you put on there, or how big your optics are. Um, and so it can really affect the satellite design all the way down to the core. Well, so, so obviously we're talking because we did uh, and we worked on non-diluted R&D funding. What made you go down that path? Um, why didn't you go through like the traditional route of funding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we actually got started with non-diluted funding uh, right off the bat. So uh, we got started in uh, April of 2021. And then a few months later, we applied to NASA's Entrepreneurs Challenge. Uh, it was one of the first times that they were uh, running it. Uh, and uh, all it required was submitting a little five page white paper and a slide deck. And so we did that and got invited to uh, the final round, uh, round two, and uh, won that as well. And it uh, really gave us a lot of great external validation in the ideas that we had and uh, getting the NASA's stamp of approval basically uh, really helped us with our legitimacy. Uh, it also came with some prize money as well, which is basically enough to cover our first prototypes. Uh, so uh, that kind of got us started down that road. And then uh, as we started looking more or for more uh, traditional investors, like traditional uh, venture capital, um, we've been uh, encountering a maybe a mismatch between what VCs are expecting and the nature of our business. Um, maybe. Yeah, so uh, we're not uh, a good fit for a traditional VC, as far as we can tell. Um, you know, the, the model there is uh, they're looking for uh, really big bets uh, that are going to provide, you know, 10x, 100x return uh, in the next few years. And um, we're more focused on creating a, a long term sustainable business. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a, a different goal. And um, so that actually makes us a, a better fit for some of this non-dilutive funding uh, from the government. So, so today, and, and you've been doing this for a while, how, what chunk of the company's like time or revenue or objective does non-dilutive funding take? Uh, it, it's about 50-50 right now. So we've raised a, a friends and family round um, and we've actually had some revenue coming in uh, from our first customer sales. Um, and that's been uh, a good chunk of it. And then uh, most recently we won uh, NASA phase two SBIR. Um, and that's almost a, a million dollars right there for the phase two effort. So um, nice. kind of about 50-50 right now. 
So, so total, uh, what are programs that you apply to? Or if I can ask, what's the total amount of like awards, not awards, but agencies mm -hmm. that you've won with? Yeah, so uh, NASA obviously has been uh, one of our best partners, a uh, great fit given that we're, we're focused on the space industry. Um, we're also looking at uh, some other agencies like NOAA and, uh, and then as well getting into the, the uh, Department of Defense and Intelligence community. So uh, we've applied for funding from the, the Air Force and now Space Force, uh, as well as DARPA. And uh, we're constantly looking for uh, new opportunities where it, uh, there's an alignment and it makes sense for uh, those agencies and, and uh, programs to fund our work. So, so what's it like working with federal agencies on these projects and R&D programs? Yeah, it's um, definitely different than uh, most of our interactions with the private sector. Um, you know, obviously, uh, public sector has very different goals um, and they can also operate at a, a different speed. So um, that's been one of the challenges there is, you know, we're uh, fast paced business, things are changing you know, week to week, month to month. Um, and then we'll submit a proposal and have to wait, you know, four to six months sometimes uh, to even hear back if we won. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the the other challenge is all the bureaucracy and uh, the forms that you got to fill out. And uh, sometimes you find yourself like five layers in uh, trying to understand what, you know, filling out a form to fill out another form. Um, but uh, the Good news is, is that uh, you know, these agencies are are interested in helping us get through this. And so there's a lot of guidance um, and uh, a lot of instructions. So it's just a matter of uh, going through and doing everything in the right order. Uh, so it's just, um, it's straightforward, but um, you know, a little bit more involved than uh, working with the private sector. So not now for us to shamelessly talk about ourselves. Um, <laughs> What, what, what was it like working with Eagle Point? Yeah, it was, uh, it was great. Uh, it was uh, very different than uh, what we had done previously. So we, we had applied for a phase one uh, SBAR effort on our own and uh, got to learn firsthand how involved uh, setting up these proposals is and um, all the little details that need to go into a, a successful proposal. Uh, there's uh, a lot of requirements even down to, you know, margins and font and sizing um, to, that you have to comply with to have a, a responsive proposal. And so uh, basically we got through one round of that and decided that we needed to bring in some extra help on this if we were going to move forward. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, help with the proposal writing and just all the minutia and um, details that need to be handled to get a, a good proposal together. That's been great. Um, the other aspect that's been very helpful for us is just finding uh, opportunities. So uh, we're monitoring some stuff, but we're kind of more focused on the NASA side of things and we have much less experience with other agencies. And so having a partner who can be um, constantly going through the list of solicitations that are announced and finding stuff that might be relevant, uh, that's been a, another great factor in uh, helping us with the um, non-dilutive funding. Do, do you think you would have kept uh, going after non-dilutive funding if you hadn't got um, outside help? Uh, I think we, we would have, but um, in a more reduced capacity. So the, the reality is that with our small team here, uh, there's only so many of us and only so many hours in the day. And so uh, we would have had to be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about which opportunities we applied to. And um, working with Eagle Point has uh, helped us accelerate that process. Okay. So, so what do you think, uh, you talked about it a little bit, what do you think are like important things that companies need to know? Or what would you want to tell yourself if you were, you had a, if you built a time machine and you're, going to come back to Jason a year back? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think things worked out pretty well for us. Uh, so I don't think I'd change a, a whole lot there. Um, uh, I think one lesson that we took from our phase one uh, applications was that uh, sometimes it's the, the proposals that are a little more out there, maybe a little bit more crazy that might actually get funding. And so um, 
yeah, a big lesson from that was uh, to not be afraid to apply to stuff that might be relevant. Um, but yeah, and then uh, in general, uh, the way that we're thinking about the non-dilutive funding is uh, we, we're looking for opportunities that are already, uh, that, that match with the roadmap that we already have. So um, we have an idea of uh, what products we wanna develop and uh, the timeline for that. And so with the non-dilutive funding, we're really looking for opportunities to uh, accelerate that and enhance that versus um, chasing uh, stuff that's not already in our roadmap. And so that, that would be my number one piece of advice is that, you know, if you have a, a business that you're looking forward to building that you already have a vision for, uh, see how that non-dilutive funding can fit into that versus just trying to chase the next proposal. It sounds like the proposals have to match what you want to do, not you match the proposals. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so what are like, next steps um what do you see where do you see zephyr as a whole what is like your your government plan if you can share these two verticals mm -hmm. uh yeah so um obviously continuing forward with the phase two effort uh with the nasa contract that we have uh and that again that's to develop our uh rad tolerant ssd um one of the interesting uh points in the uh, proposal even was uh, talk about commercialization. So for NASA specifically, um, they want to know that we're going to be a successful company and that they can just come to us and buy an SSD uh, whenever they need one versus having to basically float the, the entire company just to have access to that technology. Um, so a lot of our effort right now is following up on those conversations that we had early on um, and uh, really ramping up our private sector sales um, as we're building the prototypes and uh, getting things ready for uh, a demo flight in early next year. Uh, and then on the, yeah, on the non-dilutive side, we're continuing to look for opportunities that are uh, along our roadmap and, and fit into our current vision. Um, and so we're getting into a second generation data processor and uh, we also have plans for our own software defined radio basically be like an upgraded version of the one that we built at Capella. So, so you mentioned at some point that winning the early project with NASA give you validation. When you speak with someone in the private sector, do you feel that what you did with the agencies adds credit? Does it help the sales process? Um, does it, like at the moment, does it benefit anything with the commercial work you're doing? Oh, absolutely. It, especially as an early stage company um, in the space industry, uh, it's a very important uh, stamp of approval. Um, in the industry in general, uh, there's a big emphasis on flight heritage. And so people don't want to buy something that hasn't already been flown and worked in space. Uh, it's kind of a, a great way to prove that it can actually exist and work and that it's safe. Um, as a small company just getting started, obviously we don't have our own flight heritage. And so um, we're looking for other sources of validation that we're on the right track here. And so getting that, um, the win from NASA definitely helped us uh, gain credibility when talking to customers. So it sounds like it did make a dent with sales or advancing things on the other side. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It sounds like winning with NASA helped push things forward in the commercial sector. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it um, made us a, a lot more legitimate and basically um, showed that we had already been vetted by uh, experts in the field. And so when we talked to customers, we, we didn't, uh, we had a lot more legitimacy than, you know, just a, a few guys working in a garage. Awesome. Um, I think we pretty much covered uh, everything. Um, um, if the, any, anything else you want to share with the people in the audience or, or like an insight or something else you think is important for people to know? Uh, yeah, so my, yeah, my, my only comment is that the, the non-dilutive funding from the government uh, seems somewhat scary uh, from the outside. If you've never done it before, it's, uh, it can be quite daunting to you know, apply to a big organization like NASA, um, but uh, they're interested in working with businesses of all sizes. Um, and it's uh, not quite as scary as it 
seems like at the beginning. So uh, definitely uh, consider uh, the non-dilutive funding uh, and uh, good luck with all the uh, applications. Awesome, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, um, I wanna be respectful of yours and everybody's time. Um, so far, it's been great to work with you. And um, if anybody's in the crowd yeah, or course. listening, and, and if, the, if there's anybody in the crowd or listening in the background, feel free to contact us or, or uh, watch the episode. So uh, thanks everybody. Um, I really appreciate it. Jason, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I know you're busy, you got a lot of things to do. Um, and we'll be sending the recording and everything later. All right, sounds great. Yeah, uh, this was great. And uh, really enjoyed talking with you today. Um, is that okay if we put the name of the company in the post and uh, so people can, uh, we want people to see Zephyr at least on LinkedIn mm -hmm. or our website. You're okay with that? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I have some uh, logo assets I could share even um, and uh, share my contact information as well if uh, people are interested in reaching out. Awesome. So afterwards, uh, send us the details and we'll share them. All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot, Jason. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody who are here. Thanks for joining in the people listening to this later. Um, We've definitely had a blast uh, working with Jason and his team. Awesome company. Um, if you're a potential client and want to hear about what they do, definitely reach out to them. We're going to put the details. Um, these guys are making cool stuff, as you've heard. So definitely reach out after. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye.